Babson has been such a leader in promoting female entrepreneurship and female leaders. Uh, so first is uh, Carrie Healy, of course, the president, former president of Babson. Funny, I am here in part because about a year or something ago, I got an email from Carrie Healy, and I saw it, and I thought, huh, that's really funny. The name of the lieutenant governor when I was living in Massachusetts was Carrie Healy. And then I opened it up, and I was like, oh my god, it's the same Carrie Healy, which was really cool. And I was like, I'll take that phone call. That's a phone call I'll take. And uh, Carrie is going to be uh, having conversation with, of course, fashion icon Diane von Furstenberg, who has had uh, so many phases of her career, and even now, having uh, reached icon status, is still constantly challenging herself, growing, learning new things, and doing new things. And this is a conversation I'm really looking forward to. Uh, it looks like we've got our uh, furniture rearranged here. So please welcome to the stage Carrie Healy and Diane von Furstenberg. Thanks. Well, that's a hard act to follow. So wonderful to have uh, the Cisneroses with us. Wonderful. So, Diane, this is a great, great honor for me. Thank you. I Very nice to be here. I have been wearing your clothes since I was 16 years old. <laughs> And that was a long time ago. And I am just uh, so excited to have you with us. You are a feminist leader. You're a fashion leader. Uh, and for everyone here, when Bud Sorensen, where's Bud? Can you raise your hand and stand up? Bud, wherever you are. Um, there he is. There's Bud. <laughs> Bud founded the Academy of Distinguished Entrepreneurs in 1978. And, and it is greatly, you know, to his credit, that we are able to have this wonderful reunion of all of the members of the Academy of Distinguished Entrepreneurs here. So thank you. Thank you very much to oh, you, yeah. Bud. This, this, is, this is what this audience is? Yes. Is this audience all the people who got? Well, many, no, we have 20 of you coming back. Oh, I see. These, these are people from uh, around the world, from more than 50 different countries, and, and some of our students and, and uh, many of our alumni who are joining us here today. But Bud, in 1979, inducted you yes. into the Academy of Distinguished Entrepreneurs. I was very young. I was 32, I think. Yes. yes. And so tell us about that experience. You were the youngest and the first woman. And the to, first uh, woman, and uh, I got this award, and, uh, you know, I just come from... Well, not just, but I mean, I had, I was, I'd come from Europe and started a business and, and was very, very successful, very, very young, before I was 30. And uh, so I was, I, I was given this award by an American university, Babson, and, uh, and I came in and I was the first woman to get this award. But now that I know that the award only exists two, two years, so that's not such a big thing. <laughs> and uh, anyway, and, uh, and I remember, I mean, I was very young, and it was a very fun, you know, thing. And I remember that night I went out with the students because <laughs> I was almost the student's age. Well, our students, our students would still like to go out with you. Well, so then that would be. I don't know about that. <laughs> um, so, so tell us about your entrepreneurial journey. Almost everyone here uh, either is an entrepreneur or would like to be an entrepreneur, um, and they must look at your career and just say, how, how have you managed to find that, that niche that, that worked 40 years ago and is still one of the most successful brands today? Well, you know, when you start something, I mean, you, you know, I, I, was, I grew up um, not really know what I wanted to do, I grew up in Belgium and I went to boarding school in Switzerland and in England and not really knowing what I wanted to do, but I knew the kind of woman I wanted to be. I wanted to be a woman in charge. I wanted to be able to have a man's life in a woman's body and I wanted to be independent. And when you start, you know, when you start, you don't know which is going to be your door. And sometimes your door, your, the door for your future, is not necessarily the most glamorous one, but it's your door. And my door ended up being an Italian man who had a printing plant in Como, Italy. 
told me, because before that I had been working for a photographer's agent in Paris, and that was the first contact I had with the fashion world. And I met this man, and he said, you know, come and look at the other side of fashion, where we make things. And uh, I went to his printing plant in Como, Italy. And, you know, um, factories and plants in Italy, especially at that time, they were very, uh, it, it was very, I guess it still is in Italy, it's very family and very a craft, you know, so a printing plant, because it, it came from the Silk Road, right? The Silk Road started in China and goes through Afghanistan and Turkey and ends up in Italy. And so the silk ended up in Como. And Como was where they weave the silk to make fabric and where they printed it. And so uh, I learned about, you know, um, buying illustration from artists, taking the illustration, put it in repeats, deal with the colorist. And the colorist, you know, you work with the, the work people who are the colorists, but their father was a colorist, the grandfather was a colorist. So it, it was a very interesting way of learning. And I didn't think I was learning, I was just sitting there listening and watching. And I didn't think I would ever do anything with those things. And uh, one thing led to the next. Uh, this man who had a printing plant needed more room because his factory was smaller. So he bought a factory next door that he bought it for the walls. And the factory next door was making, uh, the, the reason they went out of business is because they were making stockings. Because at the time people were wearing stockings. And then the pantyhoses were born. Mm -hmm. And so they didn't need stockings anymore. So these people went out of business. And when my friend uh, Ferretti went there, he saw all these machines that were tubular machines that were knitting these stockings. And he said, I don't want to throw these machines. What could we do with these machines? And he called in the, the yarn the young people like Dupont and Snia Viscosa, and they experimented with these machines with thicker yarns. And that's basically how they, this man invented jersey. So jersey fabric, for the men of you who are there who don't know, there are two ways of having a fabric. You have the woven fabrics and the knitted the jersey. So he invented this jersey. So jersey printing, then he bought another factory where he could actually, where the needles were very thin in order to sew this jersey. And so, and I happened to be there at that time. So I sew, so then I had my boyfriend, uh, my boyfriend that I had met in college was in America and he was doing a, um, um, a training program for a bank. And so my mother gave me for my birthday a trip to go to New York and visit him. So I came to New York and I visited him. And there I, my, you know, my, my boyfriend at the time was a very el eligible gentleman. He was a young prince and every American girl wanted to marry him. So he was very in demand. And me as his girlfriend, I was there. so. You know, designers wanted me to wear their clothes. And, and so the fashion here was very different than it was in Europe. Anyway, to make a story short, I left after one month. I went back to Europe. I really knew that I wanted to move back to America because that was so exciting. And when I went back to the factory, I realized, oh, maybe there's something for me to do here. Maybe I make samples in this factory and I try to sell them in America. And that's how I started. Maybe you didn't want that many details. No, I, these, are, these are fascinating details. These are, yes. But, I mean, but the idea is that you never know 
what is your, yes. your way. That was my way, and I was very lucky. I knew nothing about this business, I knew nothing. I got introduced by, to Diana Vreeland, who was the editor-in-chief of Vogue, and I took a show, I, I took a showroom, I took a, a room in a hotel, and whatever. Very quickly, I became very successful, very successful at the age of 25, 26. Mm -hmm. I mean, by the time I was 28, I was on the cover of Newsweek and Wall Street Journal, and so I had become an entrepreneur. I didn't know what entrepreneur meant, but I had become an entrepreneur, and now, now you see, it's, now is the era of entrepreneurship. You know, there are all these startups and all these millennium who's starting these huge companies. So in a way, I can relate to them because I was kind of the original one. Yeah. So you obviously had a lot of self-confidence. and you Well, not every day. Uh, you know, and that's one of the things that I tell people is like, you know, almost all successful people feel like a loser at least once a week. <laughs> and I think it's important for people to know that because that is really also what motivates you and uh, and then of course you're when you're especially when you're successful whoo like that very quickly i mean it doesn't last you just don't, don't keep on climbing you know you go through all kinds of ups and downs and you know successes and failures but that's your trajectory mm -hmm. and uh, how, how did you reinvent yourself over time oh because my god i reinvented myself so many times yes but now is a time where you are as popular today as you were back then. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> you know, it's, first of all, the, another thing that I think is important for people to know is that when you are at the top, at the top of your success, acclaimed and all, sometimes people think that but you yourself know that it's not quite so good because you are going through difficulties at the time. And the same way, when people think, oh, she is a has-been, you know, it's over, you know that's not true because you already are going back up. So it's, it's, um, it's especially today that all the industries are changing, that middlemen, you know, everything, the whole society, everything is changing. It's an interesting time to, to reinvent yourself, so to speak. And sometimes when you're very, very big, oh, it takes, it's more difficult to turn. Um, so I've had, I've had three kind of careers. The first time was American Dream. And you go from zero to there, and that's very exciting. And then I sold kind of, I kind of sold everything, and then I thought I was finished with it. And then the people, of course, who had bought my name ruined it. And uh, 20 years ago, I started again, and that moment was come back kid. And then for the last, Four years, five years, I've tried to feel, okay, the legacy time. How do I do that? And I made a few mistakes in that period. I went, you know, I, took, I hired somebody who took me the old way and then the wrong way. And now I think that, so I, the company shrank quite a bit. And now I think that we are at the, at the eve of a great beginning again. And... Um, and so, okay. so it's, it's, it's an ongoing thing. And how do you stay relevant? I don't know how you stay relevant. I mean, I was lucky to come up with one dress that became a, an amazing success. I mean, never in my life I thought that, you know, this dress would be so powerful and, and so important and so iconic. Um, and, and now that everybody talks about sustainability, and sustainability is so important, that dress was really a, the original mm -hmm. sustainable dress because even if you go to a vintage, a vintage store 
and you find a 45-year-old dress, the one, the same one, it sells at almost the same price as, yeah, sometimes even more than what it is sold today. So, and there's no holes and so <laughs> I always because try of the weaving. To, because I of the always weaving. try to say that and I tell that to my designers. DVF is about the friend in the closet, you know? It's about the smart the smart dress, the dress that somehow will fill so many places and things. Yeah. I want to talk to you a little bit about feminism because you are very actively engaged. You I just am. won I, uh, an award. Uh, yes, um, yes, I was inducted. I, I told my my husband I was indicted. He said no. <laughs> <laughs> So, These are two different things. Yeah, These are, different yes, things. Yeah. I was last Saturday. Last Saturday, I went to Seneca Falls, yes. where the Declaration of Sentiments was created and the first meeting for women's rights. And I was inducted, not indicted, yeah. uh, in the National Women. It the, was the National Women's Hall of Fame. That's right. Yes. And I was with. Um, Justice Sotomayor and very prestigious women, Angela Davis, Gloria Steinem gave me the award. So it was a very, a very nice thing. So I have always been a feminist. I came to, when I when I came when I became an adult. Feminism was a big deal, and I came to America and Gloria Steinem was just and Bella Abzug and Betty Friedan. So I was very much a feminist. Always was, uh, and uh, and then feminism kind of for my daughter didn't matter that much because they took it for granted, but for my granddaughters, one of them is here tonight today. Uh, f they are real hardcore feminists, and um, and so I've always been a feminist. And I am a feminist more than ever. I am very involved in, a, I created about 10 years ago um, DVF Awards, and we give uh, prizes and money and support to women who've had the courage to fight, the strength to survive, and the leadership to inspire. You have on a necklace that says I in have charge. An, it so says you have, in charge. So, you have a whole movement now. Yes, yes. so in charge. So as I told you, I said when I was growing up, I didn't know what I wanted to do, but I knew I wanted to be a woman in charge. Then when people ask you, who do you design for? I always said, the woman in charge. And so I always use the word in charge. And until about, I think it was last year, every year for International Women's Day, we do big events in the studio and we have panels and so on. And so de we decided to use the umbrella in charge. And then I, more and more it became part of the vocabulary. And I had t-shirt printed with in charge on it. And, uh, and I remember even though my husband is super supportive always and has always wanted me to succeed, I know he didn't really like me to have the t-shirt within charge of <laughs> and, and then I thought about it, and I thought about it, and then I, I, I wrote a definition for in charge, because to be in charge is before, first of all, it's not aggressive, and it is foremost and first a commitment to yourself, to ourselves. It's a commitment to ourselves to, own, to be true to ourselves and to own who we are, to own our imperfections, to own our age, to own the difficulties, to own everything, but to be it. So the first step to be in charge is to owning who we are, not be delusional and owning it. And that's not necessarily that easy, right? And um, so that's the first thing. It's a commitment to yourself. Then, but what does it say after? I don't know, like that. <laughs> uh, because then it's about character. It's about, I always say to everybody, the most important relationship in life 
is the relationship you have with yourself. Once you have a good relationship with yourself, which means being in charge, which means not lying to yourself, then any other relationship is a plus and not a must. So that's another thing. So then I remember a very wise man, Barton Gregorian, who was president of Brown and who is a man I admire. His grandmother, who survived the Armenian genocide, told him, gave him a lesson. He said, boy, the only thing you have complete control of is your character. You could lose your health, you could lose your wealth, you can lose your family, you can even lose your freedom but you never lose your character, even under torture. So the character the re is really the relationship you have with yourself. Your relationship you have with yourself is really what makes you in charge. And therefore, all of that is really the little house inside yourself, the shelter, the home inside yourself that protects you and that is the only place where you really find your strength. So you have some very practical suggestions attached to this that, yeah. that help so you the, express that right. character so on a daily basis. That's right. So the first thing is to the commitment to yourself. Once you are in charge because you, you have a, the strength within you, then you can use your voice, your experience, your knowledge, and your connection to help others to be the woman they want to be. And you're suggesting helping two people yes. a week, so a I day? Yes, so I made little yes. micro steps. So the first step is something that I do every day. I make sure every morning that two of the early emails that I will do are things that don't benefit me. And with email now, it's so easy. I can introduce this person to that person. I don't have to leave a message. I don't have to speak. All I have to do is write a proper email, and I can change someone's life. And you'd be surprised, you know, how that's a magic. The oldest Microsoft is about microsteps is about um, using your magic wand. So that's one. The other one is about expand. So that's connect then it's expand. Expand is, I advise everyone to take one call, one meeting every week with somebody that normally you would not connect with. Because, and it seems awkward, but it expands your universe, and there again, you may use your magic wand, and very often using your magic wand comes back to you, mm -hmm. and something good and, happens And that you. kind of openness was actually what led you to your career. You were just going to learn about printing of fabric and weaving of fabric. You that's, didn't, know, you didn't right. know how this that's was right. going to go. That's right. And then the third one is, what is it? Expand was the third one. <laughs> we have a cheat sheet. Oh, here. inspire, yes. storytelling. Don't, you know, nothing is more inspiring than stories, and so, it's important for everyone to tell their stories, their vulnerability, their strength, their failure, and their success. But nothing is more inspiring than someone who's successful to open up to their vulnerability. So this is a perfect segue for what I wanted to ask you at the end, which is to tell your mother's story and, and to talk about her inspiration to you. It's, yeah, I know it's a very vulnerable and uh, no, story, I mean, I think that everyone's parents somewhat define who you are and who you will be. Uh, if we want to talk about my mother, we have to go back to um, occupied Germany, oh, no, occupied Belgium, uh, 1944, a 22-year-old girl gets arrested and taken to Auschwitz and spends the next 14, 13 months of her life in a concentration camp in forced labors, working in a bullet factory. And, uh, but the, uh, the war <coughs> ends, she survives, even though she only weighs 95 pounds, no, 49 pounds, 49 pounds. 
Uh, she survives and... Uh, and she's how old now? She's 23. 23. And um, in 13 months, she stayed yeah. there. So she's 23, she comes back to Belgium. Her parents cannot believe that she made it back. Her fiancé, who had gone to Switzerland, comes back six months later. She has regained the weight, and uh, um, she gets married. And the doctor says, oh, it's okay, you can get married, but you absolutely cannot have a child for at least three years, because you won't survive it and the child will not be normal. And sure enough, nine months later, I was born and I was not. <laughs> <laughs> and I was not normal. <laughs> and uh, so my mother, my mother, um, like many survivors, um, was very, very tough and very strong. She would never allow me <clears throat> to be afraid. If I was afraid of the dark, she would lock me in the closet, dark closet. Today she would probably get arrested. <laughs> and, uh, but she taught me that fear was not an option. She also told me that no matter what, you cannot be a victim. I mean, she made me, she made me tough. She made me strong. And I will be forever thankful to that. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. Thank you. So I'd like to end simply by asking the question everyone here wants to have answered, which especially the young women here, which is, you know, how, how, what advice would you have for young people who are thinking in today's market, because you're so attuned to how entrepreneurship has changed over time. Uh, if, if someone were looking for great opportunities today, if you were starting over today with a blank slate, what would interest you? What, what, what do you find fascinating Well, I today? think that the most important thing for women to do today is to become engineers and to be involved in that. Because the next society, the society of artificial intelligence, doesn't have enough women ethos, doesn't have enough women stories, doesn't have enough, and we, I mean, I mean, if, if we are a feminist and if we have made progress, we will go back, way, way, way back, unless we put the feminine touch and the feminine sensibility and the feminine char characteristic in the AI of today, which is the society of tomorrow. Yeah. And one last question for you, which uh, we just had this wonderful panel with the Cisneroses talking about family business. And you're a founder. You know, you are the, the first generation. And will there be other generations? Well, my granddaughter, DBF? one of my granddaughter, um, both my granddaughter, but one of my granddaughter has always wanted to, I mean, ever since she was little, so she is now working also with me. Uh, it's a family business; they own it. Uh, my whole family owns it. We, you know, we we will see. I think that, I mean, I have a we have a family of very very um, original uh, <laughs> components. Everyone. <laughs> Everyone is very original. Everyone is very talented in their own way. And we all love each other. And I think that, you know, family is family and, and, and matters more than everything. And business is business. And sometimes they merge and sometimes they don't. I think that, um, I don't think there are any rules. That's a wonderful place to end. There are no rules. Well, and, <laughs> and actually, it's important to make rules so that you can break them. <laughs> Even better. Thank you so much, Diana and Kirsten Bowman.